We are the God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Okay, time to get to it. The big one, Paul. Was he a lawless covenant breaker? Did he teach us to do so? We already proved Paul kept the Sabbath in our Sabbath series and the law. Sorry, but that's where scripture leads. But let's take this further now. Did Paul say that? What did Paul say? Did he preach against the law or reaffirm it? Hmm, there's a good question. You will know by the end of this video. There is no better place to begin than in Romans 7 and 8. The law of sin and death. Dun, 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 right? The evil law. The law is evil. Well, that's not really Paul. Because Paul didn't actually say or believe that. And we'll show you his words. Sounds ludicrous, yet this is the picture of Paul that we are handed by the church generally. Paul hated the law, right? So what is this law of sin and death then? Read or listen to many, and it is mislabeled. It's the law of Moses. One could not be more illiterate biblically. And yes, there are very large major ministries with lots of initials behind their names who preach that fraud. And it is fraud because we're going to read what Paul says and he disagrees with them. Paul's right. They're wrong. By the end of this video, you will know that Paul never calls the law of sin and death the law of Moses. But he actually reinforces the law of Moses and sets the law of our flesh, the law of sin and death, as the complete opposite from which Messiah redeemed us from. That's the curse of the law of sin and death in which we are redeemed, not the law of Moses. That is a fraudulent, lousy interpretation of someone who does not know how to read the Bible. How could this ever be preached in such fashion from any pulpit? It's called Pharisee leaven, friends. Don't blame your pastor. Don't go out and yell at people over it. No, let's restore them gently. Let's try to get them to understand what Paul was really saying. You will know by the end of this video because this is one of the foundational principles of all of Paul's writings. That's why we're dealing with it first. So now you'll fully know what that looks like. By the end of this video, you will already have enough facts to conclude Paul is being completely misrepresented really in fraud. That's what we call this in other professions and really it should be no different in the ministry. Time and time again, we get message after message just for using the word Sabbath. Now, that should tell us something. They say, nuh-uh, and they go to their fragments, out of context, of course. Romans, but Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Titus, don't worry, in this series, we are going to deal with them all. So buckle up, because here we go. Before we begin reading, I'm going to let you in on this context that one does not totally learn until the end. But watch how this proves out, and you'll see for yourself. Paul speaks in Romans, and yes, I mean all of Romans, because this is the foundation of Paul's mindset, even in other letters he wrote, in fact. Paul lays out two, and only two laws, but they are two, not one, two laws, two different laws that are opposites. This is important. I know there are messianics who say the law has several subsections, for instance, and you could certainly categorize them as such. There's no problem with that. But Paul does not. That's not what Paul is doing here, and that's not what he's talking about. 
He defines very specifically, many times over, just in this chapter that we're going to read today, you're going to see this laid out, the contrast between law number one and law number two, over and over and over again. He defines two and only two. And again, they are opposites. They are at odds with each other. So when he says law, you must ask the question right away. Which law, Paul? Which law are you talking about? When you see in the same sentence, sin, sin, death, sin, death, sin, death, that's called the law of sin and death. Now, that's the second. The first law is the law of Moses. What? Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Paul quotes the law of Moses? You better believe it directly, in exact language even. We'll show you. Don't worry. Now, he equates this law of Moses with the law of life from Messiah. See, the two are the same. They are. And this will prove it. Paul is brilliant. Paul will then quote the Ten Commandments of Moses, in fact. And that is going to blow you away, but it's right there. Really not debatable as it is exact language from Moses. Then Paul lays out the opposite. The law of sin and death. The law that is abolished. Oh, but that's not the law of Moses. The law of the flesh, our humanity, which desires to please the flesh and defy Yahuwah's law, which is the first law. The law of Moses, or law of life, from Messiah. Not this second law of sin and death. These are opposites, not the same ever in any context, in any way. And Paul clarifies that, I don't even know how many times, but probably 25, 30 times in these verses alone. Actually, I think it might even be more than that. Those are the only two laws here that Paul's discussing. No others, just those two laws. Paul kept, in his own words, the first law. Though not perfect, as he admits, he too deals with his flesh, or the law of sin and death. Paul tells us Messiah redeemed us from the curse of what? Come on, we all know this. The curse of the law of sin and death. Oh, that's not the law of Moses. We're not redeemed from the curse of the law of Moses. We're redeemed from the curse of the law of sin and death. Law number two. And he's so clear on that. Moses did not teach sin and death. Moses' law was not sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? Well, Paul will define pretty well. And in his words, you'll see for yourself. When did sin begin? Especially that which results in death? Well, wouldn't that be Adam in the garden? Certainly not Moses. Come on. That would be ridiculous. We all know that, yet we're not putting it together. Not in the church, generally. You will surely die, Yahuwah said, if you sin. Now, sidebar for a quick second. Jubilees clarifies that that warning from Yahuwah to Adam is in fact exactly literal. For a day is a thousand years to Yahuwah, and Adam died at 930 years, just short of one day. So he did die in the very same day in which he sinned. In fact, other than Enoch and Elijah, who are one-off cases, both taken from among men, all men before have died. And not one of them lived beyond one day or 1,000 years. Years. You could say Yahushua is the exception, but he did die. He resurrected, but he did die. So, not completely. Messiah came to overcome that law, the law of sin and death, not the law of Moses. That would be ridiculous. Yet that's what's preached from the pulpit in many churches all over the world today. He abolishes the law of sin and death. And not just for us, but for all of those who were before us, the Old Testament believers. We, as they, will not realize 
this salvation spiritually, we will not, until the day of final judgment, at the same time that Abraham does. Get that? It is still just as much a promise in our days, though closer in fulfillment, as Messiah is still fulfilling the covenant, building the new Jerusalem. He will judge all of mankind in one day. He'll replenish the earth again, this time with fire. And then we will realize our salvation together with those from the Old Testament. We're no different. It's amazing how the church has separated those two, and that is absolutely ridiculous. Salvation was available even to the Gentile in Exodus many times because the law was for the stranger among you as well as those of Israel. You did not have to be by blood. It has never been about blood ever. So, let's see. Did Paul say that? Let's do this. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. Oh, we're dead to the law. See, I told you. By the body of Christ, Yahushua Messiah. What? Well, wait a minute. See, we're dead to the law. That's it. This is over. That fragment tells us everything, right? Absolutely wrong and ridiculous to apply this word law to the law of Moses, because it's not. The funny thing is, that is where many stop. A fragment within a sentence out of context. What law is Paul talking about here? You have to ask that question, because there's two in this entire chapter, which he's going back and forth from one to the other, from one to the other. He calls them both law, but which law? Which one is he talking about? Which one becomes dead by the death and resurrection of Messiah? What law did he conquer? Remember, there are two laws, and he bounces back and forth, but we have color-coded this entire passage for you for clarity so you can see what Paul sees and what he's actually saying. Here, we'll prove he is saying Messiah conquered the law of sin and death, the law of the flesh, not the law of Moses. That would be illiterate that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. We are his bride. We know that. That we should bring forth fruit unto God, Yahuwah. What fruit? Doesn't that require work, Paul? Uh, big problem, right? No, wrong. Bearing fruit is not work. It is not. Not by biblical description, because you were supposed to bear fruit on the Sabbath, but you're not supposed to work. See, it is lawful to go do good on the Sabbath. That's what Messiah said. We covered that in the Sabbath series. Paul is consistent in this and actually throughout all of his writings. You'll see. For when we were in the flesh, what law is that, the flesh? What law were we in? That was the law of the flesh. That's the law of sin and death. It is not the law of Moses. That is ridiculous. Keep reading. The motions of sins. See, Moses' law is not sins. This is the law of sin and death. Which were by the law. Whoa, 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 what law? The law of sin and death, not Moses. That's what he's talking about here. That's the fleshly law. That's the one with the motions of sins. That's the law that he's talking about. This is actually very simple when you just step back and break it down. Did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now we have bad fruit. You just saw good fruit. Good fruit from the law of Yahuwah. Now you see bad fruit, just as in John 15, by the way. Messiah does exactly this and lays it out very well when he defines salvation. So here's bad fruit, sin and death. Good fruit, law of Moses. They are opposites. But, okay, 
What have we done? Paul just changed the topic. He's now going to go to the other law. So now when he says law, what's he talking about? The law of Moses, the law of life, the law of Messiah. But now we are delivered from the law. Okay, now what law is he talking about there? Because he's heading toward the law of Moses, but what law are you delivered from? Ah, there goes Paul again. Are we delivered from the law of Moses? No. We're delivered from the law of sin and death, which you're going to see him say several times here. This is so abundantly clear. There is no misunderstanding Paul on this. None. It would be ridiculous to even say so. You'll see it is very overwhelming. Messiah conquered the law of sin and death, not the law of Moses. That is illiterate. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit. Oh, 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 wait. New creature, new nature, newness of spirit. What is that? See, it's new, right? New to what? Well, newness compared to what? The law he was just talking about. The law of sin and death. Because to operate in the spirit is to not operate in the flesh. The flesh is the law of sin and death. Operating in the spirit is operating in the law of Moses, the law of life, the law of Messiah. Do you see the distinction here? It will become so abundantly clear. He just told you several times he is talking about that law in this part. Again, He'll bounce back and forth. So you have to follow along and not get lost when he's bouncing. But no, none of us are too dumb for Paul. We can understand him and know he is not clear as mud, as some have said, but crystal clear in this. Now, let's finish it. And not in the oldness of the letter. Oh, see, the letter, that has to be the law of Moses, right? wrong. It's the letter of the law that he's talking about in this passage, which is the law of sin and death. We are not being redeemed from the law of Moses. We're being redeemed from the curse of the law of sin and death. A different law. Law number two. That's the topic here. So it also was the topic a few words ago. So really can't be misunderstood. But even if so far it is, hang with me, because it will become abundantly clear as Paul gets clearer and clearer throughout this passage. So no, this is the law of sin and death, and it's letter that we are no longer a part of if we are in Messiah, because he conquered the law of sin and death. Nothing ever says he conquered the law of Moses. It's not there. It doesn't exist. Now he's bouncing back to Moses completely. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Whoa, wait, whoa, whoa. He just said the law was sin. Now he's saying, is the law sin? God forbid. Wait a minute. Is the law of sin and death sin? Duh. It's in the title, right? Yes, the law of sin and death is sin. But what law is not sin? What would he say God forbid to? He's talking about the law of Moses, which he never abolishes in the slightest, but reinforces. So he's not talking about the law anymore of sin and death. He's talking about the law of Moses, which is not and cannot be sin, is not the law of sin and death. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. See, the law defines right and wrong. In fact, to sin is to be lawless or break the law. That's what sin is, breaking the law. So the law defines what sin is. Is the law sin? No. What does Paul say? God forbid. No. He's clear. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not Covet. Ding, 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 ding. 
This is a major alarm, folks. What did Paul just do? What law is he following in his own words? Where do we find thou shalt not covet? Well, it is the 10th commandment from the law of Moses, which, let us remember, was not written by Moses. We call it the law of Moses because he's the one it was given to, but it was written by the very finger of Yahuwah. How dare anyone say, that's ever going to pass away. That is ridiculous. Or he wouldn't have written it. He would have let Moses write it if it was going to pass away. He wrote it for good. In fact, he says he's going to write it on our hearts in the New Testament, which means under the New Covenant, we are even more so under the law. But it's a good thing. Thus, Paul reinforces the law of Moses. And he is injecting right here that it is the first law, the opposite of sin and death. He's saying the law of Moses is the law he follows. It is the one he keeps and teaches, and he's doing so right now. And he does so throughout all of his writings, period. And you're going to see that. We're going to show you each one. The next part shows the contrast starts with, but, okay, so now we're contrasting to the opposite. What's the opposite? The law of sin and death. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. Again, what is sin? Lawlessness, or breaking the law. This is pretty simple when you just Take it at face value. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, Paul was never above the law, nor is he saying so. Don't go there. You can't. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, what law are we talking about here? taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Sin and death. There you go. But now he's going to bounce back to Moses, and this is going to knock it out of the park, and he does this multiple times. It's amazing that any scholar could ever read even these fragments and then claim that Paul did not keep the law and did not teach the law. Wherefore, the law, what law? The law of Moses, the law of life, the law of Messiah, is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Now, what part of that says break it? It passed away? Wrong, because it's still good in Paul's day after Messiah had already ascended to heaven. Are you getting that? Oh, this Paul just can't make up his mind, right? I mean, is that his problem? No, Paul was brilliant and specific and clear when you read him properly. The problem is that is the thinking applied because those who have no foundation in understanding Paul kept the law and he taught the law, get it wrong because they totally abandon that principle, which is fact. He cannot then break it and then tell you and I to do so. If he does, he's a hypocrite. And again, many are throwing out his words because they realize that the church's Pharisee leaven position does not reconcile. And it doesn't. I'd agree with that. The problem is it's wrong because they're not even reading Paul. So the whole thing is based on a misrepresentation even though it's a logical conclusion, but it's the conclusion is of a misrepresentation. It is not true from its inception. See, that's not Paul's fault, yet he's blamed. Peter warned us Paul was already being taken out of context and attacked 2,000 years ago. Yet the apostles left him as an apostle, didn't they? They did not remove him of his position. Therefore, they did not have a problem with Paul. Maybe on one thing here or there, perhaps, but no, 
they didn't. So that's 2,000 years of leaven. And this is where the Pharisees have operated. They've operated in Paul. Why? Because Paul was a Pharisee, and they wished to defile his teachings more than anyone. That's why they do that. Now, we all got a lot of straightening now to do, so let's get to it. Now, this one, he'll bounce to both here in the same passage, but we color-coded it for you, and you can follow along very easily. It's really not confusing, really not. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. There he goes with that again. He says that multiple times. God forbid. So he's clarifying his own words here. So they cannot be taken out of context, yet they still are. What is good? What is good is the law of Moses, according to Paul earlier. We saw that. Now, here comes the contrast for clarity. But sin. So now, this isn't the law of Moses anymore. Now he's talking about the law of sin and death. Pretty clear that it might appear sin, working death, that's sin and death, hello, his law does not require, nor does it work, sin and death. He conquered that. Okay, so working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now, watch this. Here's both in this next sentence, and it's good. For we know that the law is spiritual. Which law is he talking about? He's talking about the law of Moses, the law of Messiah, the law of life, not the law of sin and death that's coming now. But I am carnal, we all are, sold under sin, sin and death. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. That might sound a little confusing, but he's just simply saying, I don't do what I should do by my nature, my sinful, fleshly nature. That's what he's saying. My flesh does not want to do right, doesn't want to do the law. Oh, yes. He is absolutely 100% rebuking the modern church here. That's what he's doing. Because it is under the law of sin and death. But I want to be under the law of Moses, the law of life. See, that's what Paul is really saying there. But let's keep reading because he really clarifies this through this passage. If then I do that which I would not, so those things that I don't want to do, as I don't want to do good, my flesh doesn't want to do good. I consent unto the law that it is good. See, doing good is fulfilling the law of Moses. Doing bad is fulfilling the flesh. That's really not that difficult. We know this. We really know this, but we're missing it in the context of this passage. I go against my nature to sin under the law of sin and death. I do what? I keep the law of life, the law of Moses. That's how you overcome the law of sin and death. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So the devil made you do it, Paul? Is that what he's saying? No. Paul's not blaming anyone but himself. It is his flesh, his sinful nature. That's his, and he owns it. Messiah conquered that, so we do not have to live in the flesh under sin and death any longer. We don't have to. How do you do that? Well, you do that by doing the opposite, Paul says. By keeping the law of life, the law of Moses. See? He's very clear. He teaches to keep the law. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Good things is the law of Moses, the law of life. We saw that earlier. That's good. And that does not dwell in my flesh, Paul says. For that is my sinful nature, 
from the law of sin and death, which is not the law of Moses. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Good? What is good? Paul defines that as the law of Moses in exact language. We covered that. So he's saying that he's unable to do what is good. He's unable to perform the law of Moses. Why? Because of the flesh, because of the law of sin and death. These are exact opposites at odds with each other. For the good, the law of Moses, but I would, I do not. So I don't perform the law of Moses, the good, because of my flesh. Is he blaming his flesh? No, his flesh is him. He is taking the blame. Your flesh is you. You don't get to say, oh, no, 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 I didn't do that. That was my hand. (laughs) No, can't get away with that. It was your hand. You are responsible for it. Okay, but the evil, which I would not, that I do. So that which I do not wish to do. I want to do good. I really want to, but I end up doing the evil anyway. This is our struggle. This is what Paul's laying out here in these two laws that we've been dealing with since the days of Adam. Yes. So, keep reading. Now, if I do that, I would not. So you're doing what you don't want to do. You're going against your flesh. That's what he's saying. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Again, The devil doesn't make you do it. Your flesh is you. You are responsible for those decisions. Now, what do we do about this conflict? Here, Paul tells us. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God, Yahuwah, after the inward man. Wait, what law? This is the law of Moses. Paul delights in the law of Moses in his own words. Because that is the law of God, Yahuwah. There's only one, okay? The other law is sin and death. And that can't be sin and death. Sin and death is not the law of God. In fact, he'll tell you. That's Satan. But I see another law in my members. See, there's two laws. What's the other law? Well, if it's not the law of God, what is it? It's the law of Satan, right? It's the law of sin and death. So another law, just as Paul's been laying out here all along. So two laws, the law of Moses, as we see above, and this other law he's talking about now, sin and death, So what does it do? This nails it. Warring against the law. Against what law? It is the law, but it's warring against the law. Which is it, law or law? It's easy. Just read it in context. When he says, I see another law, he just got done telling you the law of God. So another law is the law of sin and death. Now when he's saying that law of sin and death is against the law, he's talking about the law of Moses. The law of sin and death is against the opposite, at odds with the law of Moses. That's all. This is very simple. So against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, sin and death, which is in my members. So there you have it. It brings one into captivity, into bondage. This is the law that is bondage, not the law of Moses. No. The law of sin and death is bondage, not the law of Moses, which is good and holy and not a burden, according to Scripture. There are two laws at odds with each other here. Don't forget that. Now he brings it home. O wretched man that I am. We are all sinners saved by grace. Yeah, grace, just like Noah was. Oops, that's not the New Testament, is it? We'll cover that. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
from the law of sin and death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Yahushua Messiah. In other words, Messiah has delivered us from our fleshly nature, from the law of sin and death. That's the evil law, not from the law of Moses, which is good and holy in Paul's words. Are we reading him or not? So then, with the mind, I myself, who's I? Paul. Paul himself does what? Serve the law of God, which he already equated to the law of Moses. Paul serves the law. What's the law of God? The law of Moses by Paul's definition. So does he abandon it? No, no way. He teaches the law of Moses. And again, here's the contrast. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, could this not be any clearer when you break it down in context? Every time you hear someone taking fragments out of this as such, let them have it. Now, this is just chapter 7. But Paul continues to reinforce and becomes even clearer in chapter 8, which we're going to go ahead and cover in this video. We'll get right through it. So let's see. Again, remember in chapter 7 and 8, and really chapters 3 through 6, you know where Paul does this same thing. You know the scripture well. You've all heard it. We've all quoted it. Chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Now, what's that? It's a contrast. It's the first law. I'm, I'm sorry. The wages of sin is death. It's the second law. It's the law of sin and death. Then he contrasts. But the gift of Yahuwah is eternal life through Yahushua Messiah. That is the law of Moses, which Yahushua is to abandon? Abolish? That's not what he said, is it? It certainly isn't what 6.23 says. In Matthew 5.17-20, through 20, Yahushua says that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill. And he even gives a timeline for such fulfillment, which is on the day of final judgment. Now, let's continue. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Yes! Oh, we don't usually read the rest of that, do we? Who walk not after the flesh, the law of sin and death, but after the Spirit, the law of Moses. Wait a minute. No condemnation? This is used as a blanket to sin and be lawless even. And no one is allowed to condemn yet. That's not what it says at all, but the opposite yet again. In order for you to not receive deserved condemnation, you have to walk, not after the flesh, the law of sin and death, but after the spirit, the law of Moses. Got to do that first. Sorry, that's truth, folks. Here is the ultimate setup for this chapter and all previous chapters, really, and really all of Paul's writings. Check this out. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Yahushua Messiah. What law is that? That's the law of Moses. It's the law of life, the law of the Spirit of life. Hath made me free. Okay, so what has made him free? So the law of Moses, the law of the spirit of life, the law of life, has made him free from the law of sin and death. What law are we free from? The law of Moses? No, that is ridiculous to even insinuate such. We are free from the law of sin and death. Messiah conquered that. Now, how are we freed from the law of sin and death? Uh-oh. It is the law of the spirit of life, the law of Moses, which frees us. The law written by the very finger of Yahuwah himself. 
The law is what redeems us. His law, which never changed. Can he amend something for the times? Sure. Did he, though? Not really. We covered even in the Sermon on the Mount, which we hear all the time. That's where the church claims Messiah established new law. And yet, we see him reaffirm five of the Ten Commandments specifically by name from Moses. Right there, and other portions of the law as well. And everything he said in basis originated in the law. Right there, it's right there, in the law of Moses. Which he reaffirms and does not abolish. And says he does not abolish. Now, we have Paul doing the same thing as he should. He better Because even though we're told the opposite, he cannot abolish law. Paul can't do that. He has no such authority. Neither do you or I. None of us do. Neither does any pope. So who does that? Who operates in this manner? The Pharisees do, called out in Scripture over and over as being against his commandments, his law. The church generally has been hijacked. By that Pharisee doctrine, that is what we call church doctrine today in many cases, unfortunately. Now we'll even break it down easier to understand. Law 1, the law of Moses. Law of life, law of Yahuwah, all the same. It's the same thing. Two laws, law number two, is the law of sin and death in direct contrast and the exact opposite, which has been conquered by Messiah. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. What? Wait a minute. What law is he talking about? Is the law of life, the law of Moses, weak through the flesh? No. This is the law of sin and death. You have to make sure you're looking at the right law. Which law is the first question we need to ask every time we see law in this passage? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. This is why he had to come in the flesh because the flesh is the law of sin and death, carries the law of sin and death, and he had to overcome the flesh, overcome the law of sin and death. Got it? Sin, sin, sin in that part of the passage. He's talking about the law of sin and death, not that of Moses. That is what he conquered, not Moses. That the righteousness of the law, wait a minute, It's a different law. It's a different mention. Righteousness law, which is the righteous law. That is the law of Moses, the law of life. Might be fulfilled in us. Of course, Paul wasn't saying the law of sin and death might be fulfilled in us. Of course not. Okay, so might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, that's the law of sin and death, but after the spirit. That's the law. Of Moses. He continues to contrast the two over and over, so you really can't mistake it. Yet they do. Law number two, he starts right here. For they that are after the flesh, sin and death, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, law of life, the things of the spirit. Pretty simple. For to be carnally minded is death, worldly, physically, fleshly minded. That's sin and death, not the law of Moses. The law of Moses is not carnal. But to be spiritually minded, that's the law of Moses, is life and peace. They are polar opposites, two laws opposing each other. That's what we're dealing with. Now he really defines it. Paul is so super clear when you look at it in true context. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's sin and death. But that's a word we know well. And I'll cover it. 
For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Well, that's the law of Moses. So again, polar opposites, you have sin and death, and you have the law of God, the law of Moses. See, sin and death is not the law of Yahuwah. It's not his plan. In fact, its curse is death. Sin and death came later, not in the beginning, as a punishment for Adam's sin. That's what's being laid out here, and that's why Messiah had to come. That's the whole reason he had to come in the flesh. Adam sinned in the flesh. Messiah had to come in the flesh and conquer the law of sin and death put into play at the time of Adam by Adam's sin. See? This all makes perfect sense. Paul is so clear. Messiah conquered that, and now we can live eternally, not in the flesh. We will receive heavenly bodies on the day of judgment, but our spirits will live forever, if we are in him, of course. But salvation is not a New Testament concept in origin. No, it's not. It begins in what we call the Bible today, in Genesis 3.15, Jubilees has an even better, very specific, incredible prophecy of Messiah. Adam did not need salvation in the Garden of Eden. He didn't need it. He would have never needed to be saved. Do we get that? Do you understand the law of sin and death was not enacted yet? Not until he sinned and then he fell under the curse of the law of sin and death. See that? We can never understand the New Testament without the Old. That is the law from which we are redeemed from. We do not have to face that death that Adam brought into the world with his sin any longer. Neither did the Old Testament, folks. That's not just for us. That's the Old as well. And just what is this carnal law of sin and death, which is at enmity? Talk about Genesis 3.15. It's right there. That word is specific to the battle of Messiah and Satan. It is the law of the flesh. Sin and death is Satan. The law of Satan, not Yahuwah's law. That is what we have been dealing with since Adam. And that is why Yahusha had to come. Yahuwah's law has been since creation. It was the same in the time of Noah. We've already proven in our Sabbath series. The same law of Moses, exact same as what Noah followed. That Yahuwah wrote with his finger, not Moses. And it remains the same law today, which we also proved out from Messiah's two commandments and also from the Sermon on the Mount and other areas. Are we in a new covenant? Yes, we are. That's what scripture says, but it is based on the old. You don't just throw it out and forget it ever happened because he changes not. And Yahushua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, yesterday is creation. He's been since the beginning. Are we under a new law? Yes, but it is based on the old. We do not throw out all the foundation of what Yahuwah has required from the beginning and start over because Messiah fulfills the law and says he does not abolish not one letter of it. We conquer sin and death by fulfilling the law, the law of Moses. Only Messiah can do that in completion. But we are to keep the law that has never changed. To be lawless without law is to claim godhood. We are not gods. We are subject to his law, which is not a burden but a blessing. Because in keeping his law, we abolish the law of sin and death from being able to even operate in our lives. This is powerful. The law is powerful when you restore it. All right, just a few more left, but this is important. And we're not going to worry about YouTube standards for this or that or what marketing you're supposed to. We're going to create this series especially based on the content, and it's going to take whatever time it takes. 
Do we wish to please Yahuwah or not? Paul challenges you as here. He tells you, you please him by keeping his law. Ooh. So then, they that are in the flesh, that means under the law of sin and death, cannot please God, Yahuwah. You cannot please Yahuwah living under the law of sin and death. Got that? He never intended that for mankind, nor did he create it. No. So, how do we please him? Here you go. But ye are not in the flesh under sin and death. So we're not to operate in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's the law of life. The law of Moses operates in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God, Yahuwah, dwell in you. So how does Paul equate this? As we have seen several times thus far, by keeping the law of life, I mean the law of Moses. That is what overcomes the law of sin and death. That is what it means to be in the Spirit. And that's why he says, if you love him, you keep his commandments. That's why he says in Revelation that those who are true believers, the remnant ecclesia, will be found keeping his commandments. They matter. They always have and they always will. That is what it means to be in the Spirit. Not some frou-frou shake about tingly experience, though he can do that if he wants, certainly. But it's about keeping his commands, his law, his way. See, folks, this is a relationship, not a quick experience and that's it. It's not saying a prayer and checking a box. It's a relationship. It's long term. It has to be. Now, some have questioned, how did we arrive here? And I told you in the beginning, in the last video, in the introduction, that we started in this whole path by just trying to find Ophir in the Bible. That's it. We were testing, is the Philippines Ophir? And we got all the way here. How does that happen? It happens because this is no mistake. This is exactly where that message leads. See, it's time for this people of Ophir especially to learn the law and restore it just as their prophecies say they will. This is not some disjointed ADD approach. It's very systematic. And we're leading here because this is where the prophecies lead. We are teaching how to fulfill the very prophecies of Ophir. This is no minor task, and as you can see, we certainly do not take our role lightly. This is happening, folks, and the Philippines will rise, and many around the world will follow, and they are already starting to join. We're almost there. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, where's that come from? Mm. The law of Moses. That's what he just said several times over. He's been leading to that conclusion. And we say Paul abolished the law of Moses. You've got to be kidding me. He is none of his. So, did you get that? If you are following sin and death and the flesh, not his law, the law of Moses, the law of life, you are not his. That's what Paul says. Does Paul ever advocate, all you got to do is say a prayer, check a box, and you're saved forever. One saved, always saved. Paul never says that. He did not say that. Or better put, if we are not keeping his law, we are not his this is why the remnant is found in Revelation keeping his law. Why the Philippines, Ophir, Tarshish, Sheba will restore his law and rise against the beast, Gog of Magog, in the last days. This must and will happen. And, let's keep reading. If Christ, Yahusha, Messiah, 
be in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. See, the flesh dies. The spirit takes over righteousness. Oh, what is that? Keeping his law. What other measure of right could there possibly be? There must be a law in order to measure righteousness at all times, at any point, in order to even use the word, right has to be defined by law. Sorry, but Paul set us up for this. And that is why the back and forth and back and forth, it might seem like a ping pong match, but it's actually very brilliant. And it is not over your head at all. You can understand this. Just keep it in context. Because now we are here in his conclusion, finding he defines being in the Spirit as obeying the law. What law? The law of Moses. And being in the flesh is being lawless. That is the law of sin and death. That is what he hates. That is what Yahushua abolished. The law of Moses is reinforced by Paul. It's reaffirmed by Messiah. It is that simple. This is the law, number one. Now, the law of Moses. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, Yahusha, from the dead dwell in you, that means you are keeping his law. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit, his law, that dwelleth in you. Yes, why are many Christians not experiencing this? Oh, we read it, we quote it. It's such an awesome verse for our different gatherings, but why aren't many Christians experiencing this kind of freedom? Well, freedom comes by keeping the law. Keeping the law is freedom, yet we're told that is the bondage. No, the law of bondage is the law of sin and death. See, they are lawless and still under the law of sin and death. We do not have to be. We can be free from the law of sin and death by keeping the law of Moses, the law of life. Back to law number two now, sin and death. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now, what is he talking about here? He's talking about salvation. Paul is talking about salvation. See, if you are not saved, you are going to experience Physical death? No, we're all going to experience physical death. It's appointed for all men to die. However, this is talking about spiritual death. Those that are not saved will die. They will die spiritually once and for all. Those who are believers will live. And that's why you see in Scripture that you will live, you will die, you will live, you will die. You see that over and over again. And in context, this is what it means. You will die spiritually. You will live spiritually. Same thing. Okay, so why? The flesh is submissive and under the law of sin and death, from which we are redeemed. But how are we redeemed from the law of sin and death? By keeping the law of life, the law of Moses. But, again, contrast back to the law of life, the law of Moses again. If ye through the Spirit, that's the law of Moses, do mortify the deeds of the body, so you kill the deeds of the body, you're killing the law of the flesh, killing the flesh, killing the law of sin and death. Ye shall live. That's the law of life. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the law of Moses, they are the sons of God. Are we the sons of God because we say a prayer and check a box? Once saved, always saved. 
nonsense. That is not scripture. We are to be led by the Spirit to do what? To keep His law, according to Paul and Messiah, and all apostles, period. And you can. Even the church agrees with nine of the Ten Commandments. Yet the fourth one, the Sabbath, well, that just passed away somehow. Well, does Paul say that? Certainly not. Certainly not here in this passage, that's for sure. And you will never find a spot where he does, nor Messiah, nor any. One, not in the Bible. So, not when you read them in context. So there you have it. One of our best teachings, redeeming Paul's words to their actual context. Paul is so clear. And Pharisee Levin has screwed this up for 2,000 years. It's not your pastor's fault. It's not whatever theologian's fault. This is Pharisee Levin, but we can all wake up. No more. You can know how to read Paul. We all can. Paul reaffirms the law of Moses as the law of life from Yahushua, Messiah, which is exactly what we already showed you in our Sabbath series. Messiah does as well. We have been in a strong delusion, but it is time, as knowledge is increasing, for the dark ages to end, and they shall. Now, go back. And read chapters 1 through 6. You will now understand what Paul is saying. Read forward in Romans. And you will see he continues with these two laws, in fact, in principle. As he always does, even in his other letters. You can understand Paul. And we can know what he says. Thank you for watching our Did Paul Say That? series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell. Like us on Facebook at The God Culture, space, hyphen, space, original. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. We love you all. Be safe. Yahuwah bless. And Shabbat Shalom or Sabbath peace if you are watching this on the Sabbath. Don't know what I mean? Watch our Sabbath series. Yah bless.